Fabulous flowers, luscious lawns, verdant veggie plots and backyards. What does your garden say about you? If it's crying out for an overhaul, or you simply need help to get started, then we're here to inspire you. Let's, let's go. <laughs> oh, that's me. Oh, OK. I'm Chris Beardshaw, passionate horticulturalist and professional landscape architect. I propagated my first seeds when I was four and haven't looked back since. Created by hand, yeah. One more chomp here. No, no, whoa, 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 whoa. And I'm Colin Donaldson, builder and landscape gardener. For me, it's always been about the property and the landscape working together. And if there's heavy machinery involved, then all the better. Going the wrong way. Going the wrong way. Guys are going the wrong way. There's the instruction. <laughs> <laughs> We're on a mission to help six families transform their gardens. So let's get up and grow. Later in the programme, we'll be tackling a romantic hideaway at a stunning seaside location in Island McGee. Well, first up, we've got Robert Moore and family, who I think have the perfect garden for a design masterclass. A uh, design, so it's right up your street? Uh, well, there's no machines, admittedly, but I do have a pencil sharpener. I guess I'd be the student then. Well, if you insist. The Moore family live in Jordanstown, just north of Belfast. The house and garden were designed and built very much with young children in mind. But now the girls are flying the nest, and it seems the perfect time for change. I'm Claire Moore, I'm 23, and uh, currently in Dublin, so I've flown the nest, but uh, the garden would be a huge aspect of our family, of the family home. It was for water fights, it was for rugby matches, it was for sleepovers on the trampoline. You know, there's a, a 40 foot zip line in the middle of the garden as well. It's a great thing actually as well in that when you have three daughters, as regards tidying up leaves and the, hands you've got. <laughs> and the autumn time, okay, we have at least another three pairs of hands and three boyfriends, maybe sometimes four or five, but they can't all come at the same time. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. And I think now it's really a chance for Dad to make it his space, make it into something that he'll be able to use, but very practical, and we've had all the ideas in the world but we haven't yet had to implement them. But now that the last one's about to leave the house, Helen's going to go uh, to university in September. I think it's real, really time for it to be dad's space now, rather than something for us. I've got very much used to the kids uh, playing here and with their friends. And I just feel that uh, now it's a nice time actually to go and uh, put my mark on the place. Um, I've watched far too many gardening programs way too many. <laughs> I need now to do some action um, and I'm looking forward to that aspect of it. The house was actually built with the garden in mind or the garden with the house in mind in that uh, from the dining room uh, there's a nice vista uh, of the garden and in the kitchen uh, the French doors open out onto the garden as well. Because the house is set in the centre of the lawn as such Probably at this stage I'm looking at maybe subdividing the whole aspect of it into maybe three if not four sections and uh, having a great variety. In fact, as you go around each corner you have a different setup uh, and a different view, a different vista. At this stage I'm not sure what my final dream will be in this. I am actually depending on Chris and Colin and I'm really looking forward to seeing what their uh, design ideas are going to be. My requirements for the garden, I suppose in today's world everyone has a fitness trainer. I'm looking for a garden trainer. That'll do me. Well, Robert, consider me and Colin your personal trainers. We'll do our best to equip you with some essential design principles, which are the secret to creating the most spectacular of gardens. I think if I was an estate agent, I'd describe it as having potential. It's, it's, it's a sort of blank canvas. It's just waiting for something to happen. I'm very delighted to hear that. And I'm also delighted to hear that you're not an estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you think? I mean, it's, well, it's, it, it, it's just crying out for somebody to carve it up because it's just big open canvas. It, it's like a room without furniture in it. It's all there, yeah. but well, 
we need to endeavor to do with you is to get some furniture into it via structure. Yes. I feel very much that it has served its purpose over this last 12, 13 years. Well, let yeah. me explain one element. The, the first thing that we can, we can start to, to, to understand about this space is the relationship between the space that we're standing in, the garden, and the building. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, these two things aren't having a conversation. You know, you've got over here, you've got just this sort of massive area of, of grass. And over there, you've got a fabulous piece of architecture. Mm -hmm. And yet the two aren't having a conversation. And we need to draw out from the building, literally draw out lines from the building through all of the windows and doors so that we can start to see the fact that there is this link between where we're standing and where you spend most of your time, which is in the building. Mm -hmm. I think as well, the house travels down nicely, the roof travels down nicely towards the ground and then there's this very bland, blank space. Mm -hmm. It is pretty boring at the moment, but you've got everything here. You see why I'm so <laughs> glad that you guys are on site? <laughs> <laughs> Robert's garden is a room without furniture. It's it's all ready to go, but it needs focal points, and the focal points will help him appreciate it more. Linking the enormity of the external space with the relatively compact nature of the internal space is best demonstrated by doing something exactly like this. Sitting in the dining room, looking out at the view that we're trying to entice ourselves out into. And when you sit here, the first thing that strikes me is this enormous horizontal line. It's like wearing a peaked cap like that. It's just squashing my frame of view. And also, look in the distance, a fabulous Scots pine. And yet, it's been decapitated by the pergola. Right. If we take the pergola away, suddenly what happens is our eye is taken up into the sky. If I can get your eye to travel through the garden and up and away, suddenly the garden appears enormous. Wow. Yeah. Because really, as we are down here, Looking at it, we have this really this lovely vista that really could be enhanced, and I think you've given us a good idea here. Should we cut the pergola down now? Um. <laughs> you've got to decide what you want to use the garden for, and if you set up a design, it's like trying to cook a meal without a recipe. You may have all the ingredients, but if you don't put them in a certain order, it'll end up a mess, and a lot of gardens end up like that. So you're getting a bit of structure in enables you to get the maximum benefit out of it for yourself. I thought we'd try a little experiment with Robert to get him thinking about the effects of garden design. One of the most important elements of a garden is the colours that you use. Now, at the moment, your garden is a sea of green. It's devoid of any colour reference, which is great because it gives us a blank canvas. But here's a game to play. We've got two perfect models, Claire and Helen, wearing different colours, reds and blues. What we want to see is which one of those colours dominates your eye because strange things happen between eyes and colours. They're exactly the same distance away from us. Which one appears closer? Uh, Claire in red. Claire in red. Two objects of the same size, but different colours, the red dominates. Just go backwards, two or three steps, Claire. Stop there. Which one is dominant now? Yeah, blue is becoming more dominant. The blue is becoming more dominant. They're about equal. Claire, go backwards again. Yeah. Helen's in her dominant blue. Helen is now in a dominant blue. So come forwards three steps, Claire. Yes. They look as though they're about the same distance away. Red is a dominant colour and you can push it further back in the landscape. Blue is a submissive colour and you can bring it forwards in the landscape. I might be doing myself out of a job here, but garden design really isn't very complicated. If you're looking for ideas and inspiration, visit other people's gardens take photographs, think about what you're looking at and the experience that you have as you walk through parks and gardens. Harvest what you enjoy and impose that in your own garden. Now theories are one thing, demonstrating them in practice is an entirely different matter. So it's time for a trip to Bally Robert Cottage Garden. We were talking about reds and blues and the colours having some relationship, one being dominant over another. But it's not just reds and blues, because any colour will do it. In fact, if you look at these two plants, you've got a calmia here and a euphorbia there. Now, in theory, they're both the same size, the same blocky nature, so they should be equally dominant. But which one screams at you? Euphorbia. 
the euphorbium. It's the yellow, it's the sulphur yellow which is leaping out at you and grabbing your eye. Therefore, whenever you choose plants, try and relate the power of that plant to its neighbour. That's going to affect how the eye moves through the garden. There is a great hesitation, I think, amongst gardeners to divide the garden up, to create deep borders with great confidence. Here's a good example. The eye travels up to this layer of herbaceous perennials. It then sees this sculptural nature of the cherry tree, which has got a very positive uplift. Your eye doesn't disappear up to the sky because of this canopy above. Where does it go? Straight through those boughs, away off into the distance. So instead of this plantation making the garden seem smaller, it actually has the reverse effect. We have framing and we, uh, the eye punctuates straight through. It appears larger. You convinced, Robert, or are you just nodding your head? I have, <laughs> I have every confidence in both of you guys. <laughs> That'll be a no, then. I suppose our visits to other gardens, and obviously I've now more focused on garden design and the content of what's actually going to go into the garden, and I'm really looking forward to that aspect of it. How's your maths? It's 360 divided by two. 180. About 180 then. <laughs> I think as a nation we're frightened of engaging with the garden. We make everything very narrow and very nervous. Let's project out from the building, project out from the hedges, look at the lines of the building and let those come out in a great swathe into the garden. And the same with hedges and walls or fences. Imagine the hedge, wall or fence falls forward into the garden. That should be the minimum depth of the bed. Then fill it full of bountiful plants. Do you think Robert will panic about uh, space being closed in here? Um, I think it'll be OK, because it'll feel closed in, but actually you're seeing over the top. So, I mean, this is going to be, you know... I'm a conical U. I'll be 1.8 high, but then I'm right down to maybe peonies or mm. something like that down here and then back up to a U. So yeah. it's more perforated than this. I mean, it's less, it's less visually imposing than this. Of course. When you're designing a garden, you've got to design the garden from all aspects, from the bottom of the garden, looking back to the house, from inside the house, from upstairs, from downstairs, from your kitchen, and just make sure you get the correct vistas and achieve exactly what you want. The garden's an opportunity for us to impose our personality and character on a wonderful open space. It's a four-dimensional reflection of who we are. Robert's lawn is his pride and joy. In fact, he's a self-confessed lawnaholic. We've been a bit cruel and asked him not to cut the grass for a couple of weeks. This allows us to mow out the shape of the design, as well, a green print for the new garden. Mm, yes, Chris, that's as clear as mud. Honestly, will you have some faith, Colin? The strategy here, of course, is that the areas we're mowing will remain lawn, Robert's favourite bit, while the rest become flower beds and borders. When you're thinking about laying out a garden, the most difficult thing is to sort out how all of the spaces and all of the plants start to interact so it's seamless. It becomes one orchestrated manoeuvre. The trick is to get a piece of perspex, mount it either on the window or get someone else to hold it and literally draw out the boundaries of your garden. Drawing out the design like this as a sketch is an easy way to capture your vision. You don't have to be a great artist and it allows you to be bold and creative without the risk of making expensive and irreparable mistakes. Because if you don't like what you've done, you just rub it out and start again. Let me introduce you to your new garden. Bench at the end, raised up on some lawn, down the steps, through the sculpture planting. Trees here framing the view. Come down onto the new kitchen lawn for summer dining. Catches the late evening sunshine. Then you've got the formal planting either side. This is the view through from the dining room at the end of which is the sculpture that's uplit. So in the winter, that's dragged straight into the dining room. And then we're on into the new part of the garden, very relaxed where we're standing down here. I'm amazed what you guys can do in 10 hours. Well done. Well, you know, the best thing about it 
If you don't like it, you wipe the board clean, you mow a new pattern. Well done, thank you. This morning I had a pure blank canvas as to what was going to be uh, presented to me. And I must say, um, tonight uh, I'm really exhilarated by just what has been shown and the prospects of what's going to lie ahead. If there's one thing that I hope Robert takes from today, it's the notion that the garden is his, to sculpt, to model and to form. And when he walks the new space, I hope he feels as though it's his and it's connecting with him. And he feels a sense of, I can't wait to get planting. Next up, we're off to Island McGee, to the home of Anna Eggert and Bill Roasten, which is still very much a work in progress. We're just um, doing major building work to our house here, which is in a very bad state at the moment, but it will be lovely, hopefully, when it's done. The garden has suffered an awful lot. Um, it used to be a sort of very plain, lots of grass, and then the outskirts plants, but the diggers had to go through it. Um, we had an awful lot of rain at one stage. It was so bad that the wall collapsed, the garden wall collapsed, and the whole thing was in such a bad state. Anne is from Germany and from the northern part of Germany, which is very flat. And also before Germany was reunited, had very little coastline. Yeah. So I mean, for a lot of Germans, this is, this is heaven. dying and going heaven. to heaven, you know, to, to have coast and mountains together. Being in a seaside location, it's a major challenge because not everything grows here. The temperature, the wind, the salt in the air, um, being so exposed, we would like somewhere that's sheltered as well. When, when we discovered this place many years ago and I saw this bit, I always had this idea that I would be up here on this strip of land and have a glass house or some sort of secret place where I could sit and paint and draw and, I thought you know, the idea hide was away. to have sun done. I thought you are coming here with your G&Ts every <laughs> evening. It's too cold at the moment. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, I mean, we've, we've had different ideas and we just need to get professional help now. nice to come into a garden where there's a great deal of evidence of action taking place. You look as though you've been really frenetic and really busy. Action or destruction? Which do <laughs> well, well, you have to do one to do the next, don't you? Of course. Yeah. A lot of clearing. The place was overgrown, completely overgrown, and you see the, 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 the remains of part of the clearing that's gone on. You're obviously chopping at the bit to get something done here. Yes, But it'd absolutely. be madness to do it with the building going on. It well, would end up just more destruction. Well, it, it, I mean, the point is that, that so many things get disrupted at once when you're doing a project mm. like this and the garden of course then has had to take second place. I think it would be nice to have a space you could go to yes. uh, just away from yes. this. You know, you've got some cracker views there. Well, uh, and that's judging that, by the time of the year. I think that's the key that the you know obviously the the orientation of the building and the eventual orientation of this garden it's all talking to the, to the coast. I mean just mm. beautiful beautiful views. Yeah. If we can start creating a space which you can later feed off in here but that space is removed, you know, after a heavy day, either <laughs> in the building or clearing here, to be able to wander off down the pathway to find a little reclusive space, I think could be quite special. I'd put all my energies down yeah. there at the moment. Yeah. Removed from the main garden, tucked under an old hedge and used for bonfires, this could be the perfect romantic hideaway. But I do think that we need to bear in mind with any of the gardening that takes place here, the maritime conditions. Yeah because this is pretty exposed yeah, for plants. Yeah. Tis. So yeah. I think we just need to bear that in mind in our eventual yeah. solution. And we already know what grows when we have a look around. Well, and these, hebe, these, hebe, <laughs> yeah. hebe. And fuchsia. Veronica. It's strange because the fuchsia mm -hmm. is a South American plant. Is it? Well, and is it, it was, here? well, it was imported uh -huh. to uh, use as a hedging plant around mine workers and stone workers' cottages. Mm. I thought fuchsia was the Celtic bush of fertility. <laughs> <laughs> Everything for you is like... <laughs> In fact, that dandy <laughs> First things first, clearing years of undergrowth. Ah, it's time for the digger. 
Look out, here comes Mr. Subtle. Well, Chris, if and doubt, rip it out. Well, at least you're consistent. Let's prune it by hand. Yeah, one more chop here. No, no, whoa, 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 whoa. No, I want to save this. OK. I want that. We'll do it by hand. OK. Actually, that's a really grand gatepost. Look at the, the cone on the top. There's a pinnacle on the top. That's very County Antrim. County Antrim pointy, County Down. Don't. Is that right? It's a sign of uh, Celtic fertility. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Can I, get, can I get my secateurs? Yeah. And uh, possibly the chainsaw. No chainsaw, <laughs> just secateurs. <laughs> With Colin dismissed to the end of the garden to practice digging stones, I can have a chance to be creative. Well, you just trim your bush, twinkle toes. Now look, this gatepost is a real find. It's a gateway to the past. And when combined with the stones that you're unearthing, and a handsome picture of you, what springs to mind? A romantic ruin. You lost the box. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the door, Flat bring it round, seat. and then we'll go for a seat about here. So we use the old sleepers and mm -hmm. put a seat in here. It's very ramshackle, it's very flowing in terms of, you know, it's, it's got to look as though it's falling to pieces. I don't want it to look as though it's just been built. No, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to look as though nature has kind of claimed the building in a way. Marine style alpine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of. Yeah, <laughs> clinging on, grappling okay. hooks. Stones, it's beams, it's grappling hooks. Haven't you got something to go and wax lyrical about? I do think one of the nice things about plants is that they, they almost, well, they give you all the information you need to know to create the perfect garden. And I mean, this, this little colony of plants here is mm. ideal when we try and understand what will grow in an exposed maritime garden, just like the one that you've got. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, there's things like the little vetch here, little yellow flower, mm -hmm. and you can see that it's a member of the pea family. But this is adapted to suit in maritime conditions. It has little tiny hairs on the oh, tips of oh the I leaves. You might that. just about be able to see them, tiny, tiny little hairs. And the salt yeah. grains perch on the edges of the hairs, so they never reach the surface of the leaf. So it's like a protective level, exactly. really, above. Right, I didn't know. So this little that. plant is telling you that Anything with a hairy leaf in your garden is likely to do well. It won't ah. get damaged by the salt, which is inevitably in the atmosphere, blowing off the ocean. Yeah. And right next to it, you've got the wonderful blue flowers of the gentian. Its characteristic for defending itself against salt is this very glossy leaf surface. Yes, it it's has lovely. a very clear sheen on it, uh -huh. and that means that any water that's carrying salt literally runs off as if it would down a pane of glass. Right and therefore the salt doesn't sit on the leaf long enough to cause any damage. It also adopts one of the characteristics of these sorts of plants. You have a lot of wind coming in off the mm. sea, they all keep their heads down. You know exactly what it's like. You go mm. to the beach, mm. you keep yeah. tucked down yeah. and you're well out yeah. of the wind. Yeah. And another plant which is sprawling around underneath is here, these little tiny leaves. Mm -hmm. just, just pick a little bit of that and see. Mm -hmm. Give it a rub and smell it and see if you can tell me what it is. Oh. Does it smell a bit like thyme? Yes. Yeah, it's the common thyme, sprawling around on the cliffs. Could you use that in cooking? You certainly can. I got fascinated with plants at a very early age and they never fail to, to really entertain and surprise me. You know, the, the extraordinary conditions that they are designed to exist in. I mean, they've been developing for, what, 300 million years and there's one for every particular point in the garden. Whenever I come across a gardener that says, there's not, not a plant that will grow there, you know, I want, want to just sort of clap them around here because actually what they mean is I just haven't found the right plant yet. And that's the trick. That's the role of a gardener, is to find the right plant and offer it the right home. Looking good, guys. Tell me, Laurel and Hardy, what the Chocolate Brothers, what's your inspiration? I'll have you know this is a finely crafted piece of 18th century pitch pine. To me, to you, to me, to you. <laughs> This is the golden version of the time that we were looking at out oh, on the great. cliffs. So, sitting so in... So smell the similar way. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and it's just really hiding behind the rock. It'll get a little bit of warmth from any fire that's in there, but it's nestling in exactly the same yeah. way as it was. 
What is That's um, Alcamilla. But have a look at the leaf. See if you can spot its survival. It's the, the, what you were explaining earlier, it has the little hairs on it, it's felty feeling. Oh, Camilla Mollis, it's got um, hairs on the leaves. Yeah, yeah, and what are they? How does that...? It keeps the salt away from the actual leaf. And the other ones... Got on the expert, Some of these things you learned? <laughs> I have learned all these things just going to Bronze Bay with him. See how infectious it is, Bill, you see? <laughs> you, you, you claimed that you, you were a non-gardener. You think it could be converted? I th I'm you're sure saying? you're going to be converted. <laughs> Let's just say I don't think you've got any choice <laughs> in the matter. I think it's not a, living with me no. anyway. <laughs> One hawthorn. Thank you very much. I've got a very young tree because they establish so much better in uh, put the poor conditions that are here. Hawthorn's so so obvious uh, a choice for countryside in Ireland too. Well, it's it's a very traditional tree. Yeah, yeah. You know, the thorn tree comes with a whole, yeah. well, a whole bagload of uh, folklore and legend. Never touch this. a fairy tree. Never, well, never cut down a fairy well, tree. Well, that's right. Yeah. You do yeah. call them fairy trees. Fairy trees. Here, trees yeah. My understanding is that there used to be a, the original inhabitants of the of the, this island, who, when a new set of invaders came in, went literally underground and became the the the, 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 the fairies. But that, that's the notion then, that they live somehow under fairy trees and so you don't touch a fairy tree. So you still see it till today, that in the middle of a, uh, middle of a field you see all these uh, rows uh, ploughed and they'll branch around this tree, you know? <laughs> and the tree's still there, won't be touched, nobody cut it down. Bad luck, bad luck. It's been fun working to your design today. <laughs> when you say fun, is that fun in inverted commas? I must admit, I was rather sceptical when we talked about it earlier. Really? I don't, yeah, I was, was, just wasn't too sure. We got this far. Right? I've done all this, all this stuff. I haven't let you down. We got, yeah. got this far and then you doubted me. No, I thought of you at the last minute. <laughs> doubted me from the beginning. I, I think it's a get out of jail <laughs> card, that's well. <laughs> no, it's worked really well. It's been good fun. It looks, it, I think, just think it. You know, give it a few months, let the algae start to come in, let the flowers start to flow in, and it just all softens. Mm. And it, it, I think it just, it just has a sense of appropriateness, you know, mm. just a sense of fit. And that's, that's the trick, I think, in a garden. Yeah, it's quite obvious, yeah. To me, this has always been a really secret area because it's an area you wouldn't know about when you see the rest of the house or the garden. It's not visible. So, you know, over all the years I've always dreamt that we would be able to utilise this at one stage. And when the idea came up to utilise the old stones, I just thought that's brilliant. And, and I said to Chris, maybe somewhere where we can sit around the fireplace, you know. And that's just what we've got now, and it, it looks lovely. It looks really nice. And the notion of building a wreck was, was quite odd too. But w when I look at it now, it's just, it's just quite spectacular. Post. Slantia, Slantia, indeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 